appreciate the opportunity to sing with the kids. Amen. Those songs we sing, I think about this, I, I, I heard this years ago. You know, Jesus, especially as far as the place is being concerned, is concerned, been dead for 2,000 years. We know he's not dead, he's on the right hand of the Father. Yeah. No other man in all of history had so many songs written. So many messages to preach. So much old giving is the man Christ Jesus. Thank God for a Savior. Thank you, Thank you Bibles, and open to this from the book of John's Gospel, chapter number three. Be grateful for us this morning. God will help us for just a few minutes. We have a baptism this morning. I'm waiting for you folks want to join the church, and we'll incorporate all of that in. I want to give you what God has laid on our heart. Amen. Be grateful this morning. John chapter number three. If you found your place and you're able, if you're not, that's fine. But if you're able, I ask you to stand briefly for the reading of God's word. Amen. This will be something with different types of preaching and uh, sort of expository preaching and topical preaching and, and this will be in all honesty a very topical message but I hope it'll hit your soul. John chapter number three, I'm just gonna read a couple of verses. John chapter three verse number one. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles except thou, except thou do. No man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with you. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the privilege you've given us to be here. God, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. God, I want to thank you above all things for the gift of salvation made available to the entire world. Jesus gave his life on the cross of Calvary. All that precious blood that was shed nearly 2,000 years ago was still working miracles today. Yeah. Father, I prayed for a miracle this morning. God, I prayed the greatest miracle that I know of. Father, somebody who's lost gets saved. I'll never understand how it all works. I'm just glad to know it does. Father, I pray for someone here this morning, they'll not be able to leave. If they're lost, they'll not be able to leave in the condition in which they came. I pray God this day will be the day they surrender their life and accept you as the Lord of their life. Now, God, I need your help this morning. Touch me physically, spiritually, mentally, in every way. And help me, God, to bring the message that you've shared with us and given to me. God, may it be a help to your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 I want to take two words in all honesty out of verse number two. And that's that's what I want to base the message on this morning. And those two words are we know. Just everybody is familiar. I, I would say almost everybody in this room this morning is familiar with this passage of scripture. This is, of course, Nicodemus goes to Jesus by night and we go through the, Jesus begins to talk to him about the gospel and tells him that he must be born again and, and in this passage on down is the most well-known verse of scripture in all of the world. And that is John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I do want to say in the opening of the, of the message this morning, that is God's will that you be saved. In this room this morning, the sanctuary, no doubt this morning there's, there's a few who are not, who are not settled about their souls. There's a few in here this morning who are not sure that if you were to die right now, that heaven would be your home. And I will tell you that you are in one of the most dangerous places 
that I can think of in one sense. And then on the other hand, you're in the best place in the world I can think of to be in this morning. You're in a dangerous place because life, I mentioned this, what scares me so often is, is that folks will come into the church or they'll hear preaching or teaching on the gospel of Jesus Christ and his power to save. And they'll have that knowledge, and that's what we're going to talk about, some things we know. They'll have that knowledge and yet refuse to do anything with it. Let me be very clear, there will come a day when you'll no longer have an option of what you do with it. There's a couple of things that, there, there, there are a couple of things that can happen, and their timing is uncertain. You could die. I was I will say this, I especially and I last Sunday, I mean I was last Sunday, I thought well, uh, as I was preaching, we had one gloriously saved by Sunday morning, young lady, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, but I, I, I thought I had a thought in my mind, maybe next Sunday I won't necessarily preach a salvation message. I may preach something different, but it's gone through the week. This is this kept coming to my mind. And so to the lost, especially that are in this room, I want to let you know something that you don't hear every day. There'll come a day when you'll not have an opportunity to be saved. But there'll also come a day when you stand before God, you'll be reminded of every time you get it. A couple of things can happen. You could die. Amen. Your age is irrelevant. You could die. The Bible says that it's appointed unto men, this Hebrews 9 27, that it's appointed unto men wants to die. Die for this the judgment. You ain't gonna make it out alive. And, and you don't know when you're gonna die. You could be young, and, and, and the sad thing is that so many younger folk think that they got all of their life. You're not promised you'll live to 70. You're not promised you'll live to 50 or 40 or 30 or even 25 while folk in your younger age. You have no promise of that. So let me be clear. You could die. Not only could you die, but the sweet Holy Ghost who loves you so dearly, whose purpose now in your life is to enlighten you and help you to see your lost condition. Help you to understand that if you die like you are, you'll go to hell. It could be that after this very morning, that you no longer feel that draw from the inside. Drawing you to Jesus the Lord. And he, he in essence, closes the door on your salvation. You say, preacher, do you think he would do that? He's done it in the Bible. Amen. One of the greatest examples I think of is when I preach along these lines, one of the greatest examples I preach of, I think of is, is, is old Noah. <coughs> Noah was in the, in the building of the ark. If I'm, not, if I'm right, I think uh, around 120 years, he was in the ark, he was building the ark, and during that time, I believe Noah had one message. Noah's message was, the wrath of God is coming, it's going to rain. Yeah, it's going to rain. And while they didn't understand that, because they had never seen rain, it did not change the fact that God's wrath was coming and it was going to rain. It's just a simple fact. And the Bible says that there was a day when God told Noah, he said, Noah, you take you, your wife, your three sons and their wives, eight people, and you go into the ark that you've been preparing under my direction. And the Bible says that when Noah and his family were in the ark, the Bible says it this way, and the Lord shut to the door. Jesus said in the Revelation, I believe in chapter number three, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now here's something you need to realize about that passage of scripture. That means that somebody from the inside has to open the door. Jesus Christ is a gentleman. He'll never barge his way into your life. 
He'll never forcibly intrude in your life, but with subtle gestures and with scripture and with preaching and teaching and the, earth and the nudging of the Holy Ghost, He'll draw you. But be very, I want to be very clear, it's your decision to make. It's your decision to make. And I'm scared that we have got we have gotten so smart. I, I will preach on some things we know. But I am afraid that in our society, we've gotten so smart that we we begin to listen to the scholars who have been wrong for years and years and years about a whole host of things. We begin to listen. And they say there is no God. There is no afterlife. There is no this. There is no. Hey, I will tell you something. They don't know everything. They don't know everything. There is a God, and He is the creator of all things. And I promise you, He knows more than the scholars. He knows more than the influencers that are having so much sway, especially over our young folk. It's sad to say, even some of our older folk that ought to know better, they might get sad what we're being influenced to believe. We believe a lot of things that are just not so. But in, in this interaction between Nicodemus and Jesus, Nicodemus, who was an intelligent man, he was a ruler of the Jews. He wasn't just your run of the meal, ordinary uh, 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 Pharisee or religious person. He was a ruler. He was one that folks would look to. And over the course of time as he had heard and probably seen some things about Jesus something began to draw him there was something about Jesus that there, there's something about Jesus that draws people Jesus said in one place he said if I be lifted up he said I'll draw all men nigh unto me now I say that and I'll say this behind it just because he draws you and you begin to move in that direction does not make you saved. Only when you fully believe and fully rest and trust on his finished work on Calvary Amen. can you claim salvation. Amen. We're being taught so much today that your salvation is, is, is by works. It's, it's up to you. It's what you do. You've got to believe the Bible to a point and then the rest of it's really on you. You got to do things. You got hey, Jesus said, and the Bible declares unto us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. Amen. I'm burdened, I'll be honest with you this morning. I'm burdened about lost folk. Because there's some things we know. This famous came to Jesus and he said, We know. Thou art teaching. Here's some things I want to share with you that we know. First of all, I want to say that just as Nicodemus spoke here, we know he was a teacher. Even, even history, outside of a few crazies that deny the existence of Jesus, will tell you that he, excuse me, that, that he was a good teacher. I will tell you that he has taught me a great deal, a great number of things. I have learned so much by reading and applying his word. Now he doesn't speak to us today as he did when he was uh, there in that interaction with Nicodemus. I mean Nicodemus and Jesus had a face to face interaction. Can I tell you that he speaks to us this day through his word. If you want to know why there's so much confusion and and so much of a will to, to weaken, to water down, or to even really to do away with the Word of God, it is because that once a person begins to allow God's Word, amen, into their life and, begin to, and begins to allow it to, to direct their life and, and lead them, then it changes who that person is, and, and the devil hates that. And so his desire is to weaken, to change, to destroy it, the word of God, and by that, our faith in him. I want to tell you, I've got a sure faith in his word. Amen. 
I'll not be dissuaded because the things that he has taught me, I have found to be true. And, and I say to you, lost person, I, I wouldn't wait, but here's, here's the thing that you can do. You begin to talk to some of these elder saints. Begin to talk to some of these elder saints that have been saved for a while and, and begin to ask them about the things that they have learned and things that they have experienced. They might in the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and they'll, they'll begin to share with you. I've learned so much. I have learned this to be true. Amen. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen. From Hebrews 13, 8, I have learned, amen, that he hasn't changed. I know the culture has changed. I know there's been a lot of change, and we see it on a daily basis. But I'm going to share with you that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has never changed. He's still the same as he was from the beginning. Amen. amen. And I'm telling you, just as he was from the beginning, able to save, he's able to save today. And if you'll trust him, he can save you. Amen. amen. He was a teacher. Well, Nicodemus said, we know that thou art a teacher. What is what is what is it about that? I, I was I was reading this script. I want, I want to read this. John chapter 7. John 7, 41 through 46 said, others said, this is the Christ. And they were talking about who he was. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was division among the people because of him. And this is uh, John 7, 44. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? I want you to listen to verse 46. The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Never man spake like this. I'm telling you, you can read all of the all of the wise men of our age and of ages gone by. You can Look up Freud, I don't even know all of those crazy names. I think of Socrates and Plato Play and all that. You can look all of that stuff up, but can I, can I tell you something? You'll never find anything that will speak to your soul like the author of this book. Amen. The Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse number 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Amen. I mean, every word in this Bible, amen, comes directly. Amen. The Bible says that, I believe it's in 2 Timothy 3, 16, says that all scripture is given by inspiration of yeah, God. Right. Hey, every word in this book is God yeah. breathed. Yeah. And you need to know this morning. That if God said something, right. it's important. Right. He's right. teaching you something. He's teaching you something you need to know. You went through school, you went through college, and you learned a lot of things. And hey, my things that helped you along life's way, and uh, things that you use maybe on a daily basis. But can I tell you what you can learn out of this won't just help you on a day to day basis. Yep. It'll help you for eternity. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yep, Lord. Thank For eternity, He's a teacher, and He wants you to know. Yeah. Even the yeah. Nicodemus yeah. said, "We know, we know thou art a teacher come from God. He's not just an ordinary." Hey, listen. When they said no man ever spake like this man, those folks they might have heard some great teaching and preaching. I, I thought about this scripture also in the book of Luke's Gospel, chapter number two, verse number forty-seven. Hey, my old story when Jesus and uh, or Joseph and Mary brought Jesus down there to the temple and they were going home and they had gone three days journey. They came back, Jesus went with them and they went back looking. Now the Bible said he was sitting among the doctors, hey, my, and, and teaching them. They were amazed. And the Bible says in Luke 2 47, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answered. You'll never find anybody that can instruct you and help you like you can. I don't understand why it is in our day and time that we so refuse his teaching. 
Look at the world today. You know what's going on? Here's, here's, the basis. here's basically what's going on in the world. We see all this sin and wickedness. Here's what is basically happening. It is an absolute rejection of the truth of God's word. In a nutshell, that's what it is. It's a rejection. It's rebellion against the word of God. Why? Because they don't want truth. They want their own truth. Now we have, uh, what is, I can't even remember, the, they've got a name for it, but basically what it is is this, if you have a truth and, and it's really not true, but you believe it, well then I'm supposed to accept that that's true for you even if I know it's not. Hey, can I tell you, truth is, is not variable. Truth is not variable, it doesn't change. Truth doesn't change. What was true 2,000 years ago is true today. Amen. The soul that sinned, it shall die. That was written, I believe, in the book of Isaiah. And can I tell you that that's still true today? He's a teacher. Let me, let me get you something right quick. And I, I just want to, it's just as the Lord brings it on my heart, I, I want to share this with you. But in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 55, he's teaching. Amen. And, and we go back to this. And we wonder, what do I need to do when I, when, I, when I understand the truth from God's word, the truth that I'm lost, and the truth that I, if I die like I am, and, and, and if I die in condition I'm in, I'm going to die and go to hell. What do I do about that? I like Isaiah chapter 55, and it says this, Oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye by and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. He's saying to you, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Yeah. You'll find rest for your soul. Can I tell you, it won't cost you a thing this morning. Amen. To take under his teaching. Amen. And accept what he's taught. And believe on him as the Lord of your life. Won't cost you a thing. Amen. <laughs> Good I'm so glad. I'm so glad it's not for the rich, but yeah, bless the Lord. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Hey, listen, I'm glad it's not for the rich folk. I'd never make it. I'm glad it's not for royalty. I'm not glad. I'm glad it's not for a a, a, a particular group of people. Why? Why? You know, real whatever. Hey, man, I may not have been one of those. But he said, whosoever will, let him come. Hey, man, listen to me, friend. What he wants you to understand his teaching is if you are lost, that just simply means you've never accepted him. He loves you and he's wanting to instruct you and teach you this morning. His desire is to save you. Amen. He's a teacher. And he teaches. He teaches the soul. Never a man spake like this man. Not only did, did, did Nicodemus understand and know that he was a teacher, but I, I want to say this. Not only is he a teacher, here's something else we know. We know he was holy. We know he was holy. Mark 1. Now I believe Nicodemus understood this too. He would have never come to Jesus had he not thought bad of him. He knew they were something different. Mark 1 verse 23. And I, I want to point something back to you. Mark 1 23 and 24. There was in their synagogue man with an unclean spirit. Now I want you to see this. An unclean spirit. That means he's possessed by a devil. devil. He's possessed by a devil. There's a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out. Jesus has come into his presence. And he cried out. This unclean spirit cried out saying, Let us alone. Unclean, unclean spirits don't travel by themselves. I'm telling you something. You get one, you'll have more than one. Right. Little by little, you know, here's why, and, and it could very possibly be that in this morning there's some folks in here got some unclean spirits in them. You're doing things you know y'all not to do, whatever that may be. You know it's wrong, you know it's sin, and there's God, amen, digging at your heart, trying to help you understand, amen, that there's something going on inside of you that's wrong, and they're not alone. Unclean spirits traveling paths. Right. Amen. That one man in Mark chapter number five. Amen. Mark chapter number five. One man that was running through the tombs and uh, naked and cut himself and 
Hey, man, when Jesus cast the devils out of him, the Bible says they entered into the swine yeah. and were given a number of our two thousand of them. Hey, man, run headlong into the sea and drown themselves. Yeah. Hey, you may start with one, but it won't last long. Right. That way things come into your life and you'll gradually get worse and worse and worse until you're absolutely shot, spiritually speaking. And you'll do things you never dreamed you'd do. Hey, man, you'll act and say and go when you never thought you would. Hey, man, and you cannot control it. Yeah, that's right. Good preach. You can't control it. You've done giving yourself over. You rejected the teaching of God. But that unclean spirit cried out. Thank you, Lord. And he did say this. Let us alone. What, what, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? This is what an unclean spirit said. I know thee who thou art. Yeah. The Holy One of God. Yeah. Jesus is holy. Yeah. Amen. It, it, it's sad. Hey, the demons know he's holy. That's right. right. They, the devil knows he's holy. Yeah. But we don't know. <laughs> We don't know. And we forgot that it's holy. I, and you say, well, how, well do you, what makes you say the way we treat him? Yeah. The way we treat him makes us, make, makes us understand. We don't think of, him, of his holiness anymore. I mean, really, some folks treat Jesus as like a, a spare tall. Yeah, right. Everybody, what do you, what do you make? Well, you only pull him out. You only call on him when, you, when you're in desperate need of something. Yeah, right. All the other times you're just going on and doing it your way and just going about life and not making a thing. You don't pray. You don't read your Bible. You don't come to church. You don't. You don't. You don't witness and try to share the gospel with anybody. You don't need Jesus. But now let the bottom fall out somehow, some way. All oh, we're gonna run. We're gonna get in church. We're gonna get in the altar. We're gonna start living right and doing right. Hey, man, as soon as things get back on track again, we're gone again. But I want to tell you, he's holy. He's holy. What does that mean? In a moral sense, that means he's clean. He's not able to be proven guilty of even one sinful act. Let me just say this. From the cradle to the grave, to the tomb, not one sin could be verified and legally prosecuted against Jesus Christ. Nobody has ever lived that way before. You know that. Yeah. You know it. I mean, you read the scriptures, we find that even when Jesus was on trial, that, that they were paid liars and lied that, uh, against him to prove him guilty. But they knew he went right. I would have said it later. I would have said it. Said it. He said, I find no fault in this man. I'm telling you, he's fault. Holy, that means, that means in a moral sense, he could not be proven of one guilt. He couldn't be proven guilty of one sin. That's not like anybody else in this room. Everybody else in this room has sinned this week. You ain't lived so good all week that the thought or something hadn't crossed your mind that I've not been there. But he's holy. Not only in a moral sense, but I, I want to say this. He was free from sinful affections. You're drawn, we're drawn to it. Amen. And I mean, from the pulpit to the back, we're drawn to sinful things. I mean, that old flesh wants things. I mean, it, it, may, it may not appear bad to some folks. It may, could be finances, could be a host of things. We like to think of things on a, on a darker side. But there's a lot of things that are sin that most people think nothing of. Jesus was not drawn. He was not. He had no sinful affections. He couldn't even. I wrote this down. He couldn't even think of sin in such a way as to be tempted to commit sin. Now Jesus obviously thought about sin. He came to, to forgive sin and come to save from sin. And so he was very conscious of it. But in his personal life, he was so he was so clean and so free from that. He could not even begin to think about personally committing sin. Yeah. Right. Listen, nobody, there's no savior like that. There's no savior like that. 
He's, not, he's holy is what I'm saying. That's right. yeah. Amen. Not only did he not sin, I want to say this, he could not sin. Yeah, that's right. I, that's been a debate I've, I've heard. From time. Let me tell you something. He's God. He couldn't sin. He's holy. He couldn't even fight to sin. And, and, and can I say holy also means this in a spiritual sense? It means to set apart to and for a sacred purpose. His name shall be called Jesus, for he shall deliver his people from their sins. Jesus came into the world for one reason and one reason alone to save the human race. That means you and you know it. See, there's some things we know. We know he's holy. We may not, we may not dwell on it, but we know he's holy. And if you know he's holy, you're probably going to act a little bit around. Amen. We know he's holy. We also know this. We know that Jesus saved you. Can I say to you that I have never heard somebody say this? Now, maybe you have. I've never heard it. I've never heard anybody say, Buddha saves. <laughs> Amen. I mean, I have. I know it's, it does sound funny, but it's funny because you've never heard it. I've never heard anybody say Krishna saves. Never heard him say Muhammad saves. I've never heard anybody say all of us. I, I really have not. Oh my life. I've never heard anybody. But from the time that I can remember, as a young fella, I remember hearing we, there's a song in our hymn book that says, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Name Jesus saves. All of my life. Can, can I tell you something y'all know? You know that Jesus saved. <laughs> and you know that he alone saves. That's his purpose. Matthew 18, 11 said this. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. I want to be real clear. I want to get right down here with you. And I want you to understand something. In this sanctuary, I've already mentioned the simple fact that there's folks in here that are lost. Understand this, that when Jesus came, he came for you. There's a lot of folk in this room this morning who understand that and have accepted that. They're called saved folk. There's some folk in this sanctuary this morning who know that and yet have rejected and, and have yet to receive it, thus meaning you've rejected it. And you know that. But he said he came to save that which was lost. You, whoever you may be, in the sanctuary this morning, are the reason Jesus came. I don't know about you, but it makes me feel pretty good to know that Jesus loved me enough that he would leave all of the glory that he had in heaven and that it would come down here and he would take on himself the, the flesh of man the, a, a robe of a flesh if you will and would live his entire life knowing what he faced in the end and that because of his because of his love for me he never turned back he never shirked what he came for he went all the way to the cross simply because he loved me yeah. and I was he was the only hope that I had yeah, I wish I, I wish I was a better preacher and I could get it down deeper. But if you don't see that, you'll never understand why. He did what he did. He loves you. He came for you. From the least in here, as far as age is concerned, the greatest in here, as far as age is concerned, you're the reason Jesus came. He came to save. What he came, what he came to say, what, what does that mean? Well, he came to save us from our sinful nature. Romans 7, verse number 18, 
And this is the Apostle Paul, probably one of the greatest men that ever lived. One of the greatest preachers and greatest soul winners that ever walked the path outside of Christ himself. He said this, he said in Romans 7, 18, he said, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. You know what we've been lying to about? We've been lying. Somebody's told us we're good. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that's not, people don't like to hear that. That they're not good. Can I tell you something? You're not good. Yeah. I'm not good. Just, just so there's no big eyes and little news in here. I'm not good. I'm no good without him. Right. And I say this. I said if, if people ask me, Say something about me being good. I said, for being good, he ain't going to get Because I know me better than you do. <laughs> and I know I ain't no good without it. Somebody's lied to some of you and told you you was good. One thing I've forgotten is it's not your standard or their standard that we've got to empower our lives to. I mean, if it was up to me, and you folks that I know pretty well in here, you're all good folk. And uh, so if you was going on, if you was going on what I thought, you'd probably be all right. But you're not. Yeah. That's why this is so important. Yeah. Is because when I I can line myself up against my standard, I'm a good guy. I'm a top notch guy. Matter of fact, according to my standard, you probably ain't gonna find nobody much better. <laughs> but my standard ain't no good. Yeah. Even my standard ain't no good. Because yeah. it's woefully short of his standard. Yeah. And you say, why does his standard matter so much? Because of God. Yeah. That's why. Wow. You say, well, I don't like that. I think I'm, I'm sorry. I can't help that. All I know is, is his standard is what I've got, what I've got to hold to. And I can't. The only hope that I have, and this I know to be a fact, is that Jesus did. Because he alone is able to save. And Paul said, I know that in my flesh dwells no good thing. I wish I could get you to see who you are without him. If somebody's lied to you and told you that you're all right. He said, For that I know that in me that is in my flesh will no good faith. For the will is present with me, not that is to do, to do good. But how to perform that which is good, I try not. We don't even know how to do right without him. We don't know how to do good without him. And, and listen, that's, that's a nature that you were born with. That's a nature you're born with. You can't help it. I couldn't help it. How to hold it. But only he can save me from that. And he did. Not only did he save me from my sinful nature, but he saved me from the rightful judgment of that nature. Romans 6 23, very familiar scripture that says, For the wages of sin is death. Gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm not to hurry, but I, I, I want you to understand we talked about dying a few minutes ago, that everybody in here is going to die. Jesus said in John chapter number 10, He said, I've come to give them life and that more abundant. He also said in that scripture in John chapter number 10, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. All right? So there's two types, there's two types of eternal life. One, we would call it eternal life. That is, if you die in the Lord or trusting in the Lord as your Savior, if you'll trust that knowledge that you have Amen. and accept Him as your Lord, you'll have eternal life. And when you die, you really don't die. You really just begin to live then. But there is also eternal death. Now I say, you're going to live forever. You're going to live forever. And you know that. <clears throat> Some things we know. Something inside of you tells you this life is not all there is. Listen. 
ain't like this no way. I mean, they try so hard. Why do atheists try so hard to fight against something that they don't want to exist? If I was an atheist, you'd never even be saying that. God, what, what is God? What the, I mean, atheists fight so hard against something they don't want to exist. That's crazy, God. That's crazy. You know. You know it's real. And, and the Bible says that there's a judgment. Judgment is dangerous. And that's, like I said, it's not just to just die and stop breathing, heart stop and brain stop. It's an eternal thing. I'm not going to go all the way through that this morning, but over in Revelation chapter number 20, it's very clear what, the, what eternal death looks like. There'll be nothing like it time for all eternity. He saved us from our sinful nature. He saved us from the righteous judgment of that nature. And then finally saved us from the alienation that is, that is a natural consequence. If you go into Luke, I believe it's Luke 16, you read about the rich man and Lazarus. It's either 15 or 16, I've always confused. 15 or 16, both of them are good. But you read about the, the rich man and Lazarus, you'll find that when the rich man died, the Bible said he was in buried and in hell, he lifted up his eyes. And to be clear, that, that is not a parable. Jesus is telling of, of an event that happened. So in hell, we find that the rich man in hell lifted up his eyes and we find he could feel. He said, I'm being tormented in this flame. Let me tell you, when you die, you'll still be able to feel. The Bible says that he saw some things in hell. You have eyes. He said, let, let Lazarus, let somebody come and dip their finger in water and just touch it to the tip of my tongue. I tell you, you still got a tongue, you can still taste it. Oh, just because you die doesn't mean it's still. <coughs> the worst part of all of that is the angel spoke and said, Look, there's a great gulf that's fixed. There's a, there's a chasm, there's a, a gap, a space. Between us and you, and, and those that would come from you to us, I'm paraphrasing it, but they cannot, and, and neither can can someone from here go that. There's no hope and no help. Look right up here. Everybody look right here for just a minute. If you die lost, there's no hope for you. There's no hope. And you know that. There's some things we know. He saved us from that, and that's that alienation. Can you imagine through, through eternity being alienated from God in a place like it's described to us in the Bible? <coughs> I can't imagine that you know it. So I'm waiting. You, you know. You know. God gave you that. You know that. And here's the last thought. Here's the last thing I want to show you this morning. Now we know we've got knowledge. What about wisdom? Knowledge is an accumulation of facts. I talked about some things that we know. Now wisdom is a different thing. Wisdom and knowledge are two different things. Wisdom is what you do with that accumulation of facts. If you know that Jesus is told you, if you know that he's a teacher, if you know that he saves, that's good. But it's useless unless you're a fire. In the story of Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, I'm not going to take time to read all of that, but in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, we read about the wise and the foolish virgins who, who were waiting for the bridegroom. The Bible says the child came and they had, they had oil in their lamps. They were ready. Five games that they didn't have. They didn't have what they needed for. And it says, while the bridegroom tarried, right now, spiritually speaking, the bridegroom is tarrying. Jesus has not returned yet, but he's coming. While he tarried, those five foolish virgins 
ran out of ran out of oil or didn't have what they thought they, they didn't have what they needed, they wanted to get some more. While they were gone, the bride and groom returned. And you read that scripture down right toward the end of it. It says but those foolish virgins asked for oil and said the wise virgins answered and said, Not so, lest there be not enough for us. You'll be rather them that sell by for yourself. And while they went to buy the bridegroom came and they were and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And the door was shut. See when the door was shut, you can't you can't get in. Just like we talked about with Noah there a little while ago. When the door gets shut, your opportunity for salvation is over. Everybody outside of the yard died. Yeah. Everybody outside of the ark died. Yeah. Everybody outside of Jesus Christ will die. And you know that. You know that. <coughs> Bible said, I will come also the other verse saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say to you, I know you not. See, there's some things he knows too. And he said, I know you not. What a sad day, not musicians came. It's going to be a sad day when you stand before the Lord of glory and, uh, and you begin to talk about all of the things that you've done. You go to Matthew 7 and you find this. And you'll find that there'll be a day when the Lord in judgment will say, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. You know who Jesus knows? You know who he knows? He knows those who have trusted him. Yeah. He knows those who have trusted in his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. He knows those who have completely rested their soul with eternal faith in his hands. That's who he knows. Does he know you? Does the bridegroom said to him those foolish virgins come? He said, I know you not. And I, I just want to say to you, there's some things you know. And in closing, I'll say this. Some of you in here know you're lost. I just try to share a little bit, and I will honestly, I, I'm a great orator, but I'll try to share just a little bit of what God laid on my heart with you about your soul. Now, that's knowledge. What you do with that is wisdom or foolishness. So I want to counsel you and encourage you today. To not be foolish. If you're here today, you know that you're lost. Today's the day to be saved. That's wisdom. The wisest thing that I have ever done in my life. Grew up, I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up under a good man of God. My dad was a preacher. And uh, I lived a Christian life and even until I was saved. I was in church, I knew all the right things, but they came to night, and I found out all of that didn't help me. I had to make a decision, and I got wise one night. I got wise one night, and I got out of my bed, and I said, Lord, save me. I'm lost. Lord, save me. I, I can't do this on my own. It's the greatest day of my life. I tell folks, and I get this is a fact, my memory is horrible. I still struggle. Some of you know here know this. I still struggle with names sometimes. My memory is horrible. I remember when I got saved. I remember the day I was born again. I might have never forgot that. The wisest thing I ever did in my life. If you're here today and you're lost, you're going to be the wisest slave that you did.